When you build something with your own hands like this, well, it's very satisfying. And today on the American Woodshop, I'm going to show everybody how easy it is to build this masterpiece, a shaker-inspired tall case clock. So stay with us today on the American Woodshop. So much fun. The American Woodshop with Scott Phillips is brought to you by Woodcraft since 1928, providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Pro Tools, for tool pros. Rikon Tools. Woodcraft Magazine. Projects, plans, and web links designed to help you make wood work. P.S. Wood, home of Timberwolf Swedish Silicon Steel bandsaw blades and super sharp scroll saw blades. A bed to sleep on. A table to share meals. A house that feels like a home. The Furniture Bank of Central Ohio. Providing furniture to neighbors in need. The Shakers had an eye for simplicity in their design. All of this is Shaker inspired. The dial and the Shakers, well, they would use beautiful maples and cherries and walnut. And this is bird's eye maple here. And then this is tiger maple here with a bit of ambrosia in the very middle. And it makes this clock. I mean, look at that wood. But it's also the design of this. It really sets it apart. Now, I'm going to take these hands off very carefully, and I want you to see the key to making this clock on your own. Yes, you can make this. This is not a difficult project, but the only fussy part of this clock you're about to see, it's the mechanism, and this is called an eight-day movement. And you have these weights that when they're fully up, will run the clock for eight days. And then setting this is a bit tricky, but building the hood, as this is called, or bonnet, and then the tall case, and then the base, that's all very easy to do. And there's no fancy joinery to this. It's just graceful. Now, to understand the Shakers, this is the best book that I've ever come across. It's called Shaker Oval Boxes. And the guy, John Wilson, had it down when he said that the oval box epitomizes shaker design. It's graceful, it's elegant, it's simple. And the shakers were all about that, keeping their hands to work and their hearts to God. And this is inspired work. So let's head over to the table saw and get started on this. We just need a table saw, a couple of handheld drills, a drill press, and a sander, and we can build this together. Let's go have some fun. Now, before you work with any of the tools in your shop, be sure to read, understand, and follow the instructions that come with the tools and products you use. Work safely. Think about what you're about to do. Now, I want you to look at one thing. Um, these are safety glasses. Hearing protection here. We're going to use the crosscut sled to cut the work pieces into manageable lengths, cut any of the twists and warps out of the boards. And, you know, if you buy your boards wisely, you don't have to joint them. Just side them, make sure they're flat, plain to the thickness you want, which in this case is 15 sixteenths. I'm going to cut the boards into lengths that I can work with around defect. Get them flat, plain to S2S right now. Then, once we have a decent straight edge, rip them down so the edges are parallel with the rip fence and getting them to the right width for the clock project. And then I can take them back to the crosscut sled and do the final square cuts, making it S4S. Now all the boards are S4S. These edges are parallel, ripped on the table saw, and crosscut accurately on each end. Now what I can do is create some pockets on the backboard, which is the foundation of the entire clock. So it has to be right and it has to be solid. So. I just line it up, draw it tight, and then clamp it down and drill the pockets. 
I'm using an impact driver with this stepped hex adapter. Those are very handy. There's a stop that prevents you from going too deep. So that's what we do for the pockets of the backboard, which is 79 and a quarter long, 10 inches wide. Now the other thing that we're going to work on, let me move this over so you can see it, the dial. That's a key design piece right there. And I've already made the frame for the glass, which is three inches top and bottom, inch and a half on each side, and that's screwed together. And that is ready for glass once we sand and finish it. And we're going to do that outside in a bit. But the dial here, here's the frame for the dial, and this is screwed together, four inches top, inch and a half at the bottom, one inch wide here, seven eighths inch stock, and you can see this is counterboard. Now, what's the difference between counterboard and countersunk with this style of bit? Well, if you counter bore, it's deep enough that you can put wood plugs in it, sand it flush, but don't do that just yet because if we take that home, we can't finish it and then bring it back in and cut the groove. So we need to be able to take this apart. Countersink just means a counter sinking in enough that it, the screw head is flush. You couldn't fill that. So, to make everything come together, I'm using these stops. And what I can do is use a counter boring bit for a pocket hole screw. Take it on in, just like that. Two places, like that. And you could use a drill press to do this and use a fence, and that's another option, but if you don't have a drill press, this is a good way to go right here. And then fine threaded, inch and a half long square drive screws, wash your head. These are painted, it's easy to select the right screw that way. And I think the painted screw actually gives me a little bit more holding power. You wanna pre-drill it. So that's how I make the frames. I'll get this done, and then we'll put the sides of the case on. To sand all the parts, I'm working outside, N95 dust mask, on dust collection. I have a five inch random orbital and a finishing sander. And I'll work through 100, 150, 220 grits. Now, before I start sanding, I wanna show you one thing. Remember, this is the backboard with the pocket holes. The side work pieces here are 15 and a half inches from each end. So that makes it very easy to work with and finish. I'm not going to put the other one on until I have all the parts sanded. Sanding them now, thoughtfully, not rounding over surfaces, is the best way to go. So I'll sand it all down. Once it's sanded thoroughly, tack it off, get it clean, and then we're going to spray it outside with garnet shellac. So I'll get that done. I'm using a very affordable spray gun that does a good job, and what I'm doing is dialing back this trigger. The harder you pull, the more it puts out. Very simple gun. This is garnet shellac, and a pound and a half cut. And it absolutely brings out the color of the figured maple. The whole idea is keep it moving. So I'll use this to color the maple, all this is hard maple, figured and uh, bird's eye and tiger stripe. I'm doing it outside. If a bug were to happen to land in this, I'd leave it alone, let the finish dry. It does far better if you do it that way. And then go back and buff it down with white nylon. And then this will get top coated with wax. That's an easy finish, and this is fast with this very affordable spray system. Okay, some folks say you can't use shellac like this. I beg to differ. I like to do things on a budget. This works well. If it does get drips and runs, you've put it on too heavily. Also, I always keep a brush handy in one of these keeps, so that's just denatured alcohol, so I can brush that out. 
So I'll get this all done and then it's inside to do the assembly. In from the sanding and the shellacking. Now what we can do is put the pieces together and that way when we put the wipe on finish and the wax on it, we'll get a perfect finish. So what I'm doing right now, this is the back of the clock, the long piece. I'm lining everything up so that I swing the mating sides up left and right. I have witness marks here. And now I'm going to use the pocket screws, the inch and a quarter, fine, going into hard maple. You don't want the coarse screws. Okay, the fine work best. And let me get that secure. There are other ways to do this, but I'm building this project for folks that want to build their own as well that may not have an army load of tools. Okay, so that looks really good. Now I'm going to slide this down and we're going to work on the top first. And to do that, we bring up these pieces left and right and I've already got these measured out and all I have to do is use an inch and a quarter fine threaded square drive washer head screw to the pilot holes and I join these left and right. Once I have both of these on, then I put on the top trim board, which is right here. So I'll just get that all together. Make sure you pre-drill the pilot holes. That looks really good. Okay. There are really three parts to a tall case clock. One is a case, and we built that with that long running backboard. One is the top, the hood, or the bonnet as it's called. And the very top of the bonnet is a two piece assembly. And here's how that goes. Of course, everything has been pre-drilled, so I just line up the screws to the pilot holes into the backboard. And I can draw that tight, pressing down here. And using the table to keep this square to the backboard. And now, making sure that everything lines up to the pilot holes. Draw that tight. And that squares it up. And then I can stack this routed edge. Now, if you look closely at this profile, that's called a classic profile. And that's done with a handheld router. And whatever you do, wear side shields on your safety glasses when you're out, and wear a dust mask, and route so that the router bit is feeding into the rotation. That way you get the best cut, it doesn't tear out. Start on the end grain first, then go on the long grain, and then finish on the short or end grain again. That way you'll have minimal tear out. And that's also what I use to do the base piece as well. And you'll see that in just a second. So what I'm going to do is start this screw. So the point just barely comes through and it mates to that other piece that's already been drilled and attached. And what that does is that gives me perfect alignment. So everything squares up nicely and it looks right and it's balanced left and right. Now I'll draw this together and then it's on to the base. There's the bonnet, here's the case, here's the base. Now again, I've pre-drilled pilot holes so that I can draw the side pieces of the base together and I, all I have to do is line up that screw point with the pilot hole and that gets it perfect right there. And you go, Scott! What's that mess on the edge there? Well, I brushed out yellow wood glue on all mating surfaces here. And these are biscuits, number 20 biscuits. And to make these cuts, I just secure the workpiece to the workbench and then I use the biscuit cutter 
to create one half of the four inch diameter saw blade cut that gives me a circular shape for the number 20 biscuit to mate in, both left and right work pieces. That helps to align the edges. So that's how you use a biscuit joiner. Now I've let that glue cure out just long enough, about three, four minutes, that when I put the pieces together they won't skate around and they'll still be nice and strong. So let's drive this other screw in there like so. Draw it tight, like that. Sometimes it can be a little bit ornery, such as life. And then that piece goes in, this piece goes in, and you're about to see the beautiful trim piece come up and on. And naturally, I've already inserted the biscuits in the right places, and I can flip this around. When you're Using yellow wood glue, make sure you put glue on both mating surfaces to make the joint nice and strong. So now I'm going to line that right up. And you can see that the edge is routed. Talked about how to do that earlier, and that's flush, and that's flush. That's good. And we'll get a clamp in just a second. But this is the bottom of the base, and it overhangs just right. So now what I can do is line up the pre-drilled holes and this balances that bottom trim piece perfectly on all edges and this will get blocked foot on each corner right there. But before that happens, that looks really good. I'm going to slide this out just a hair and put clamps on that, let that cure out. Need good clamping pressure here, left and right, and just need to make it snug. Nice bead there. Same thing on the other side. And this will all get buffed down before we do the wipe on finish coat. The shellac's there to seal the wood, but it's also there to bring out the grain. That looks really good right there. Like it all. And so, We'll let that cure out, and as that's curing, let's go over to the table saw, cut the grooves for the glass and also for the dial. To groove the work pieces, I've unscrewed all the parts. I've put blue painter's tape so it doesn't mar the finish or the shellac on the top outside edge. So as long as that blue tape is out and on the top, I know I'll be grooving everything the right way. So let me show you. I'm using what's called a gripper. It's got a hook on the back and this is adjusted and locked in place so that it completely controls this workpiece. I put the gripper down to the table, keep it square, and then I put a, another push block on top and make sure I feed that into the blade that's adjusted up to make a half inch cut. So let's make that cut, workpiece well away from the blade, and let's just see what we've got here. Never stand behind the workpiece. Now, that switch is leg activated. I turned it off, okay? I'm letting that blade come to a complete stop right now. Okay, that's good. And that is a non-through cut. We have that groove. Now, that's how we groove all the workpieces to accept not only the glass in this case, which is perfect, just like that, for the glass panel, but also we groove the workpiece for the dial, same exact way. So I'll make all those cuts right now, and I wouldn't even think of doing this without the right tools. This gripper here contains that workpiece, then another push block to hold it down. Make all those cuts. Never ever engage that blade until it comes up to speed.
Now comes the time to use the groove cut at the table saw in the frame assemblies to slide the dial and the glass into that groove. Now, the blade I used on the table saw was a thin curved blade, so that works really well for these inserts like that. And I want a little bit of side-by-side -side play on this just so that I can adjust it to fit the clockworks, which is going to be the next thing we do after we screw all these parts together. So matching up the grooves, and you'll see that these screws are color-coded. Makes it nice to know exactly what screw you're dealing with. And in these counterboard holes, I just set the screws. And I want to hand tighten these after I get it close with this impact driver. This is a matter of finesse, not force. Okay, and that holds the frame nicely. And so the big thing is the wide part is up. And then one other little thing. You see this is called a VIX bit. And that's how you center up the holes in the hinges when you pre-drill the pilot hole for those. And these are zero mortise hinges here on the back of the glass panel that was inserted into this frame. And here we go. We just get that ready, and then I'm going to show you how all this stacks up. And you go, aha, I have the moment. Here we go. Wax the screws. That will work a whole lot better. So now, this with, being careful of the glass, the date up, 1840, which was when the shakers were in their prime, just fits in like that. It's a pressure fit. And once I have the hinges on here, then it butts up against that. And then this flips over like that. And that gets screwed in place. I'll do that. And then we're on to setting the clockworks. I'm using no mortise hinges for the door, and there's a ball catch, and this is a brass pole that's just on a screw post. Same up above here, screw post, and magnetic catches hold the door shut. Now let's see how this is working, because honestly, this is a fussy mechanism. And you look at the strikers, and you can bend those brass wires in and out. And to set this clock works, there's a frame assembly and you can see how the pendulum hooks into the bottom of the clockworks, and then you ease that up and into the cabinet, being very careful of those delicate strikers. And we'll take that on around, and we'll trigger it. Some adjustment required. You'll have to become an orologist. That's a person that works with fine clockworks. And let's check that out one more time giving the mechanism a chance to work here. Okay, and the whole idea behind this is these weights. This is the heaviest one. These are two or half the weight. Drive this for what is called an eight-day movement. So I'll get this all set up, and we'll get the final reveal in the end credits. These are spectacular. Now, whatever you do, build your own tall case shaker inspired clock because it will be a masterpiece and be patient with it because once that work is set it'll give you perfect time next time in the american wood shop it's on to art deco stole so join us then thanks for being with us today see ya woodcraft since 1928 providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen woodcraft helping you make wood work. Pro Tools for Tool Pros. Rikon Tools. Woodcraft Magazine. Projects, plans, and web links designed to help you make wood work. P.S. Wood, home of Timberwolf Swedish Silicon Steel bandsaw blades and Super Sharp scroll saw blades. A bed to sleep on. 
a table to share meals, a house that feels like a home. The Furniture Bank of Central Ohio, providing furniture to neighbors in need. For more information on tips behind the American Woodshop and watch free episodes 24-7, check us out online and like us on Facebook.